Welcome to the inaugural edition of Our Two Senators. I'm State Senator Bruce Tyr, the Minority Leader of the Massachusetts State Senate, and here with my colleague, State Senator Katie O'Connor Ives. We both have the pleasure of representing North Andover. And Katie, it's great to be here as part of the original show, and let's talk a little bit about what we have planned for this show for now and future episodes. Happy to. I'm very excited because with this program, this local program provided by North Andover CAM, we have the opportunity to provide you with legislative and budget updates. The name of the show is Our Two Senators because North Andover is fortunate enough to have strong representation with two representatives and two state senators. It's an interesting situation and one that very few communities in the state can boast. But the great news is that uh, we work together as a delegation on a whole host of issues, Katie, and that's why I think this show is so important and we think you'll find it valuable so we can talk a little bit about not only what's happening on Beacon Hill, but also what's happening locally where we often work as a team on a whole array of issues, some of which we're going to talk about in this show. Absolutely. We hope to make this a regular program where we can update residents about what's happening because sometimes the pace of government is somewhat slow and sometimes it's quite immediate and we would like to provide you with those important updates. So this is an example where within 30 minutes we'll try to pack in as much as possible about recent governmental events that impact North Andover directly. Well, why don't we get started with one of those that's really pressing, and that is one that involves the environment, uh, one that involves our community, and certainly uh, one that is going to require a response over time uh, by state government and by municipal government, and that is the drought. Uh, by some accounts, we are currently facing in our region up to a 10-inch water deficit in terms of rain, and we're trying to find ways to deal with that. And some would say, Katie, well, you can't really deal with it because it's a force of nature, and to some extent that's true but we have to respond. And I know uh, one of the things that you've been focused on is trying to make sure that we have resources available for businesses, uh, particularly farms uh, as we have in the area, that might need help with cash flow because they just aren't able uh, to sustain the crops they usually can. Mm -hmm. People would be surprised to know that we in Massachusetts have many, many farmers that are dependent on rainfall. And fortunately, there are state and federal opportunities for our local farmers to tap into so that they can weather this situation and be able to get some micro loans because they've lost a lot of crops over the summer. And so one of the things we want to do is make sure people know that they're available mm -hmm. and we can help Absolutely. with that. So if they reach out to our offices, uh, we will be able to steer them in the right direction, whether it's the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, whether it's the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or the Small Business Administration, which has been very helpful in the past in things like flooding that we've experienced in North Andover, they can be again here. Mm -hmm. And especially with the state loan opportunities, those deadlines are sooner in the month of November. There's more time for the federal loans, but if folks call our offices directly, we can help facilitate that process. And, and we look forward to doing that. And again, we would work as a team on that to help people. And if we need to bring experts to North Andover, if there's a, enough people that, to require that, we would be happy to bring experts out and have that discussion. Yes. One of the things that we can help with. As recently as August, Governor Baker came right to North Andover and visited Smolock Farm, took a tour, and brought a number of uh, relevant secretaries and commissioners to the table to talk about how it really makes a difference at the local level if residents are considerate in terms of just the basics not watering outside, not wasting water domestically, and also buying local, which is helpful for the farmers to fill in that gap. Well, it absolutely is because that value added from a local purchase can make the difference for a local farming operation, and we certainly saw that at Small Art Farms. There are others that are in similar situations, so we want people to buy local, and it is one way where you can directly help the situation but in turn, uh, the larger issue of water conservation is an important one. And we tend not to think about it mm -hmm. until we're in a drought. But the fact is uh, faucet restrictors, low flush toilets, a whole host of things can make a real difference all the time in trying to conserve precious water resources. And that's one of the things we're working on as a team approach. And very soon we'll have information about a regional meeting that's going to happen where we're going to try to look at those issues and also try to look at surface water storage. So we don't depend on things like extra withdrawals from the Ipswich River. We can look at ways that we can try to maintain a good supply of water by capturing it when it rains in a more efficient way. That's a way to deal with the problem in a more general, uh, more global sense, but it's an important one. 
And it's interesting to note that residents who may think that it's just temporary or something that might not impact them as strongly, when the farmers in our local area have such a small window in terms of making their business numbers work to stay in the black, something like this could really put them over the edge. And folks might only notice that if they see a local farm or two not return for the next season. Yeah. So I think that's where residents can also really make a difference. So between local farmers really taking advantage and not being shy about these micro loan opportunities and also residents realizing it might not affect me but I like having the local farms in our area and we need to support them yeah. is really important. You're absolutely right and, and I think this is one of those situations where we have to emphasize there are things we can all do. Mm -hmm. It isn't something that's beyond our reach. We right. can buy something at a local farm. We can think about our own household and what we're doing to conserve water. And we can think about how our communities can work together to capture more water and store it so that we're less vulnerable to drought situations. I, again, we are experiencing as much as a 10 inch rainfall deficit. That's gonna take a long time to recover from. We don't wanna be putting ourselves in that kind of jeopardy in the future. We should think about what we can do to avoid it. Absolutely, we don't know what the next summer will bring, yeah. and hopefully we can learn lessons from this, this past summer. No question. So we've talked a little bit about water in one sense, and we've talked about a lack of water, but in, there's another place locally that we have a, a sufficient amount of water to make a lot of people happy, and that's Berry Pond. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's been a great source of accomplishment for the legislative delegation working together, and uh, we had some success most recently in the state budget on that front. We did. This is an issue that our whole North Andover delegation has been focused on for a while, and we know that the residents, not only in North Andover, but in the whole Merrimack Valley, value Berry Pond and an open berry pond yeah. that has lifeguards and good water quality and we knew that was where we needed to do the work. So with your leadership in this very most recent budget process, funding was included to support the Department of Conservation and Recreation in finally opening up Berry Pond for swimming. Well it was great and again it was a team effort and we secured almost $85,000 to help with that mm -hmm. with uh, again a lot of good work, a lot of teamwork. Uh, because Berry Pond and the State Forest itself have a lot of support and mm -hmm. so uh, we were able to convert that into some action but also credit to the Department of Conservation and Recreation because they have been meeting with our legislative delegation consistently mm -hmm. to be able to make this happen and they were looking to identify resources we were able to come in through the state budget and add additional resources and it all worked out mm -hmm. and so we're very fortunate and uh, you mentioned uh, them once they should be mentioned again uh, the friends of Berry Pond mm -hmm. and the friends of uh, Harold Parker did a tremendous job in trying to rally uh, awareness of how important this is and make sure that it was a priority for so many people. It's true and, and that really catalyzed the commissioner to work with the friends because he wants to figure out in the state there are many nonprofits that have a similar type of mission where they're trying to supplement the funding yeah. of the state parks. So are there best practices that the friends here can learn from so that they can be successful in their fundraising efforts yeah. as well? It's, it's been a great effort and I think we should point out that like many great efforts it's going to need to continue. Exactly. So I think a great foundation has been built. We've identified some uh, dollars. Uh, the uh, pond has been reopened. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's stewardship and we'll need to continue to look at this and we welcome uh, folks joining the effort and offering their thoughts and suggestions on things like some of those best practices that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the more people that see it as an attraction and a great local recreation resource, the better because they'll be able to be brought into the fold to help support the pond. Yeah. And I've always argued that it's not just a pond for swimming, but when folks talk about issues like substance abuse or challenging situations with bullying and what do we do with teen free time, having a local resource in the peak of the summer for them to get exercise and be social in a safe space is part of that public safety solution. There's no doubt about it and I've heard so many instances where people talk about uh, life can be very stressful mm -hmm. and to have an open space where you can go and recreate and uh, think about uh, things in a space that where there's no pressure and we can enjoy the natural environment is so important to our quality of life and of course we're very fortunate that even though we are a relatively small state in terms of our land area, we actually have a very high uh, number of state parks and forests and things of that nature, disproportionately high. Mm -hmm. So over the years, people in Massachusetts have prized those open spaces. We're lucky to have some of them right here in our own backyard. 
And I heard someone say that when we were celebrating the 100th anniversary, and we talked a lot about Berry Pond at that time. Uh, somebody from a neighboring community said to me, how lucky am I? that five minutes from my home I can be in the midst of all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a message that we all take to heart. Mm -hmm. It's important because the tax dollars that people pay translate into maintaining these facilities. And whether it's Salisbury Beach or it's Berry Pond, it's always really important to know that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to maintain the wonderful resources that we have. It's true. And so uh, I think folks can rest assured that we're going to be committed mm -hmm. to continuing to work on this and looking for other opportunities uh, to be able to work together. And one of those opportunities is not so much open space. In fact, it's very much a piece of our transportation infrastructure uh, that we've been able to work together on a very busy Route 114. Mm -hmm. Another great example of a team effort with our North Andover legislative delegation. We, a few years ago, went before the North Andover Board of Selectmen, and it was there that we learned that it was very important to the town to address some pretty serious road sidewalk pedestrian safety issues around the vicinity of Merrimack College. Well, one of the great things is the working relationship we do have with the Board of Selectmen and the town administrator in North Andover. They have an open line to us, and we feel like we have the same one uh, going back to them. Right. And one of the things that we do that folks may not be aware of is periodically, uh, usually at least annually, we meet with the Board of Selectmen and the town administrator and say, what are your priorities for us? Right. And that was one of the clear priorities. My recollection was that it was not long when we started after we had had the tragic death of a student, I believe it was in 2011, a Merrimack College student uh, that led to folks questioning pedestrian safety in that area. And the Board of Selectmen said very clearly to us, we need to address this. Our legislative delegation rolled up their sleeves, took that to heart, and uh, my recollection is we first had a highway safety audit mm -hmm. uh, where folks came together, including uh, folks from Merrimack College and subsequently folks from Royal Crest Estates. Right. And that was a very good dialogue that we were all part of. It was important because we needed to get the first responders, town officials, the college, Royal Crest, all these different relevant stakeholders around the same table. And MassDOT was extremely supportive of, of the initiative to have a detailed road safety audit all the way from 495 past the college to assess what all of the different needs were. And what was really great is that the timing lined up very well with the transportation bond bill that came before us in the Senate and we were able to include $1.5 million in that bond bill to start to address some of the safety needs. And you know, that's a critical point because I know uh, sometimes folks say, well, state government studied something, and but a study doesn't achieve action. But in this case, it absolutely translated into action because $1 million of those uh, bond funds were released. Mm -hmm. They were matched uh, by $1 million uh, from the college. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you can go to 114 today and see a new crosswalk and new signalization mm -hmm. to address one of those major safety concerns. So this is a real example of a study producing a result. Absolutely, and it was just in time for the beginning of the college season. Yeah, so that'll serve us well, but mm -hmm. I think folks also need to remember, uh, like Berry Pond, this is an ongoing issue, right. and so there are plans to conduct even further improvements. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the intersection uh, that is just to the west or north, depending on how you look at it, of Merrimack College, and trying to elevate maybe the uh, islands and do some improvements there, but also to improve sidewalk coverage right. in the area. And there is even a long-range plan, perhaps, to increase the width of Route 114 to enable pedestrians and traffic uh, to successfully uh, share that space. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to be done, uh, but I think folks can take stock in knowing that the Board of Selectmen raised an issue. We all worked together and responded, and again, tremendous credit to, to Andrew Mailer as well for his role in mm -hmm. this. And we got a result. We've demonstrated that we can make an improvement, and we've got more work to go, and we look forward to a continued team effort. This is another important example of an issue we want residents to know is at the top of our priority list. Absolutely. So it's, um, it's really important, and again, uh, an ongoing project, and uh, speaking of another ongoing project, uh, one of the things that haunts not only uh, people in North Andover, but people all across the state, is the issue of the opiate crisis mm -hmm. and the devastating toll that it's taking on individuals and families all across this state. And folks have asked and demanded action. Folks in state government take that very seriously, whether it be the Baker administration or the House or the Senate. 
Uh, but we certainly, in the last two legislative sessions, have been extremely focused on this issue with two bills, uh, one in the prior session and one in this session, and I think they're both beginning to have an effect. It's true. The first piece of legislation we took up is now in effect, and that was focused on expanding treatment options and making more beds available because we know that when people that are struggling with addiction have a critical window to seek that treatment and there's no bed available, that's a travesty, not only for them, but for their family and the whole community. So that was focused on not only uh, providing for more treatment beds, but specifically for allowing insurance companies to finally and hopefully uh, comprehensively cover at least 14 days of treatment for someone seeking that type of counseling. And what I like to say is that in shorthand, the first bill that we did, which was in the last legislative session, was a lot about treatment. Mm -hmm. It was about making sure that people got beyond just a couple of days of physical detoxification so that we could actually get to treatment of the addictive behavior. And that takes a lot more than a couple of days. So that mandate was somewhat controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to reiterate, what it said was that you have 14 days of inpatient treatment and after day seven, there's going to be planning for what's going to happen next. So there's a discharge plan. So someone isn't leaving treatment for substance abuse and going back out into the community without having a plan and having resources to continue their path to recovery. So that was an important bill. Mm -hmm. The way that I like to think about the second bill that we did, the most recent, is it was a lot about prevention right. and trying to prevent folks from forming addictions in the first place. And we certainly had a hearty debate in the Senate about the over-availability of painkillers in our society. Mm -hmm. It was important to focus on the sad reality that many people begin this path of addiction with legally prescribed drugs and to recognize that providers have a huge part to play to make sure that they're safely and responsibly issuing these medications. So we had what I think is a fairly novel idea in terms of what we called a partial fill option. So that literally if patients re receive a prescription for perhaps 30 pills and they realize when they go to fill that prescription that they don't need that many, they can actually go to their local pharmacist and say, I'm going to fill it for half that amount. I know that in turn I will have to get another hard prescription, a hard copy, but I don't want extra medicine in the house for many reasons. I want to not make myself exposed to addiction. And we've also put in that bill the requirement that prescribers have to explain the risks and addictive nature of these medications. Which is an amendment I was particularly pleased with, the, one of my amendments that you worked on with us and that we were able to get passed in a very bipartisan way so that at least there's a conversation between prescriber and patient right. about that drug. And I think that's critically important. And the issue of partial fill, uh, we know is a little bit controversial because there's federal law in that area. So we had to work very carefully mm -hmm. not to run afoul of a federal preemption so that the law would stand and, and withstand a legal challenge. Critically important. There are other parts of the bill that I think help to back that up. One of them is having a promulgated list of alternatives to opiates for painkillers so people know that they have some options. A second one was helping to bolster and make stronger the prescription monitoring program, which is something that many folks may not be aware of, but something that doctors and pharmacists asked us for routinely, mm -hmm. which is a way to track who was getting what prescription so that if you went from one provider to the next, they would know what's going on and they could help to monitor the situation and offer an intervention where it was warranted to prevent someone from forming or, or increasing or exacerbating an addiction. Really important tools. Right. We also made sure that there was a section that required more robust take-back programs to make sure that medicine's not languishing in people's cabinets or being flushed down the drain. And it's really incumbent upon the manufacturers to provide the technology or the convenient options to safely remove those unused drugs. It's absolutely the case because you mentioned it once and I think we've all heard stories of someone who had a routine medical procedure, maybe a dental procedure, got too many pills mm -hmm. and didn't know what to do with them. And too often those pills are finding their way into addicted hands and we need to stop that. And we took some great strides in doing that. We also uh, took some other very strong steps uh, relative to the use of Narcan. And one of the things that we've done, uh, both in the Senate and in the House, uh, with the governor, is to try to make Narcan more available. It is a life-saving drug that is now administered routinely uh, by our police and fire personnel. But one of the concerns that a lot of folks had was that people may be dosed with Narcan, be brought from the edge of death, but not then have additional medical treatment 
or at least screening to make sure they're okay. Mm -hmm. So in the Senate, uh, as well finally in the House uh, in the final version of the bill, we took steps to make sure that when that happens someone can be taken to the hospital and screened. That's a very fine line in terms of requiring that to happen, but we did take those steps. I think we still have more work to do on that front, but it was important. And relatedly, for our first responders, it had been way too challenging for them to access this drug, yeah. and it was terrible to see that the price was actually going up and up and up. So we focused in the budget process on creating a bulk purchasing program yes. so that our first responders wouldn't have to use a grant process to get the access that they need. So that's dramatically brought down the cost for them so that they don't have to spend time applying for grants when they should be on the streets protecting people. Absolutely, and in all of my conversations with folks who are on the street protecting all of us, both in EMS uh, as well as uh, in law enforcement, uh, they're suggesting that they are using the drug, they have the availability of it, mm -hmm. uh, and it is working and it is saving lives. So I think we've done some good things there. But we all know that the opiate crisis is not over. We have more work to do. And it seems that uh, pretty clearly that we're going to need to have additional legislation in the coming session. And our legislative colleague, John Keenan, uh, mm -hmm. introduced legislation that did not make it at the end of this session, mm -hmm. which would even further extend uh, the time for treatment inpatient. I'm pretty confident we're going to see that legislation again. I'm so glad you mentioned that proposal because we recognize that 14 days is not a solution and that if it's merited per the health care provider to say that this individual requires more care, and we know that addiction is sometimes a lifetime process, that piece of legislation is much more realistic in terms of the time it might take. Yeah. And overall, it will save the Commonwealth money if we're able to provide insurance coverage for people that are struggling with this battle. There's no doubt about it. So I think that will get a, uh, a very early uh, public hearing, and mm -hmm. it's going to be something that we're going to be focused on, along with something that uh, we collectively have been learning about, and that is the lack of downstream beds. So. Uh, the situation comes where someone has their preliminary treatment, 14 days as it may be right now in Massachusetts, but then the next several subacute steps are not available. Uh, those beds and their lack of availability is impacting the availability of preliminary treatment beds, primary treatment beds, because folks are recidivizing and recidivating. I'm sorry, and going back to uh, the original front line of right. defense, where we could have a much more efficient system of helping them step down in terms of the level of intensity of treatment. That's something I think we'll be looking at in the next session as well. The other thing that's important for local residents in the Merrimack Valley to know on that subject of uh, treatment beds and availability is that Sheriff Cousins opened a wonderfully successful detox center right at the Middleton House of Corrections. And over the summer, the original treatment center was for men, and he replicated that for women. So I think it's important if, if someone in North Andover knows a loved one who's addicted and they're really struggling to access a treatment option. I think that's another resource for people to look into. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that too because uh, we also can be helpful in that situation mm -hmm. and there are certainly plenty of folks you can call uh, but if you know you're not getting uh, the kind of result you need or you don't uh, feel like you're getting access, folks can feel free to call us and we'll respond. I know our office does routinely. I'm uh, suspecting that your office does as well. Of course. It's a fairly common occurrence, unfortunately, but if folks are struggling with a time-sensitive bed placement issue, they can call our office and we can help facilitate a solution. Yeah. So we can help today with those imminent situations and those emergent situations, but in the long term, we're also going to be working, uh, you and I, and I think the Senate generally, to try to create more infrastructure so that people have a place to go in a cost-effective way. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's still more work to do in the area of education under the topic of prevention. And there's still more work to do with the accountability of the manufacturers to help finance some of the response to this addiction problem. Yeah. You know, Katie, you mentioned education, and one of the things that you and I have focused on in the area of education is the situation of unfunded mandates. Mm. And I know we don't have a lot of time left in the show to talk about that, but it is something that we should start talking about in this segment. And that's because every time uh, you and I and our colleagues meet uh, with local officials or with school officials, we hear about the burden of unfunded mandates right. that are proclaimed from Beacon Hill and sometimes from our regulatory agencies that are not necessarily on Beacon Hill but close to it mm -hmm. and wind up having a uh, negative effect 
on budgets and the effectiveness of our local uh, government institutions. I know that you had several meetings uh, with school officials about that not all that long ago. We did, and we're working closely with the auditor on a piece of legislation that actually passed in our Senate budget, and I thank you for your support and leadership on that. And we also attempted to get it passed through the Municipal Modernization Bill. It passed there in the Senate as well, but the focus is, is to strengthen the communication that needs to happen when state regulators are proposing changes that are going to have an immediate cost to our local officials, whether it's education or transportation or any of these really costly issues where municipal and state affairs uh, intertwine, it's important for the funding to actually be there to implement it yeah. and not just say to the local city or town, make it happen and the resources aren't there. That's not fair. We see it happen time and time again and this bill would simply create a dialogue where if a regulatory agency proposes something that would have a cost impact, they have to communicate that to the municipality and the municipality needs to give them feedback in addition to the auditor's office that has its own office of local mandates. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to empower them to help our municipalities respond to these unfunded mandates. Well, and I'd be quick to point out the reason we even got to this point was legislation or an amendment rather that you had offered in last year's budget mm -hmm. that I was happy to co-sponsor that uh, created a report done by the auditor and there were fundamentally two recommendations. You've referenced them mm -hmm. and that gave us something to be able to work on. So I'm fully supportive of the process that you've mentioned and in fact uh, you've been helpful in my idea to go even a little bit further which is to allow folks to apply for relief particularly on educational mandates from the Department of Elementary and Secondary mm -hmm. Education and if they can make their case uh, we would require the department to consider that case and consider providing relief from the mandate. So I think we've gotten a good start because this has been an issue that's been out there for a long time. But we've made some progress. Again, like many things, we still have work to go. But I would say that we're in the middle of this effort and we're very close to getting some more results. Mm -hmm. I think that people are taking notice that we're not going to relent and we're going to find the proper vehicle to make this change because we can't continue to have a situation where there are finite resources for something like public education in a municipality and then there are just relentless requirements that have a cost either in personnel time or in hard dollars and it's not sustainable. There's no doubt about it and it's having a negative effect on their ability to achieve the priorities that people have right. either again for municipal government or for school districts or for both. Mm -hmm. So it is an important subject and one of the difficulties has been in the past trying to winnow down lists to actual items to say okay which mandate and I think we're getting closer to being able to do that. But more importantly than focusing on an individual mandate, what we're trying to do is create a process so that all of the mandates mm -hmm. can be examined and there can be relief, number one, for ones that already exist, and number two, uh, to prevent the creation of any more unfunded mandates in the future. And I think we both uh, ought to give a lot of credit uh, to the folks that have been working with us on this. They, they come uh, with their lists, with their ideas, again, local officials, school officials, and we are using that information, I think, in a very effective way. It's true. So very often the ideas that we move forward on Beacon Hill actually originate through residents themselves. Yeah. So that's why it's so important, whether there's a pre-existing bill that residents call us and make their opinions known on the record, or propose new legislation that we can carry forward. Well, it's true, and along those lines, this would be a good time to remind folks that we are very eager to hear from them mm -hmm. uh, with their legislative ideas and to give them an update relative to the legislative session, uh, which right now is an informal session, but begins a new informal session in the first part of January, and that's when we have the opportunity to file new bills. So if folks have ideas for that, we'd love to hear from them. Absolutely. Well, you know, Katie, it seems like we're running out of time, but we ought to say thanks to folks for joining us. Yes, and I think it's important to also take this opportunity to thank our local North Andover Veteran Service Officer, Jerry McGuire, who provided these lovely flags in the background for today's show. It's a real team effort, and we're very pleased to be part of it. Most of all, we appreciate you tuning in to listen to what we have to say. We hope you'll continue uh, to tune in and watch our shows and provide us with information, because after all, democracy is not something for spectators. We all need to be engaged in it. Thank you for your interest and your engagement. We look forward to more of it. We'll see you next time.